Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Tom and Fung discussed the issues, these challenges of retrogression and redeployment that are facing EB-5 today. And so what I'd like to do now is just highlight for you some of the policy changes that, that are surrounding the EB-5. And the key question here is, of course, is you know, what has Congress done to address these challenges? And unfortunately, to date, very little. So for some background, you know, the EB-5 uh, Regional Center pilot program has been extended every two to five years um, until 2015. And that's when retrogression first started to be felt for the first time in EB-5 history. And so Congress started to take a closer look. But as we know, you know, immigration policy in the United States is, to say the very least, controversial. Right? And it's very difficult. Congress has struggled to achieve a consensus to pass meaningful immigration reform, and not least of which on EB-5 to address these issues. And so since September 2015, the EB-5 Regional Center Program has been extended repeatedly, a short-term extension 16 times since September 2015, each time without any changes. Uh, the current sunset date is September 30th, 2019. The, the, just these past few years, Congress, you know, many bills have been presented before Congress or circulated drafts, circulated in Congress, but none have gained any traction, none have passed. And we've reached a point where we're experiencing a certain policy fatigue. Um, the priorities of EB-5 reform has centered around raising the minimum investment amount, redefining TEA, and how do we determine what, uh, uh, who determines TEA, and increasing government oversight and in strengthening the integrity of, of EB-5 program. But when Congress you know, repeatedly failed to achieve a consensus to, to make that reform, the spotlight then shifted to DHS and USCIS to effect change through the rulemaking process. And so out of all this, uh, what we have is a new regulation that's pending now, um, and could uh, right now it's at its final stages and could be published at any time and, and then go into legal effect. And one of the um, primary goals or primary points to this is that it will increase the investment amount from uh, to $1.8 million in non-TEA or $1.35 million in TEA. It also wants, seeks to take or make fewer projects qualified as TEA. And so what it will do, uh, this regulation, uh, because the majority of EB-5 projects today are TEA, right? 95% of projects are TEA and including areas that are not perceived immediately to be high unemployment areas, such as uh, downtown Manhattan. And so this regulation uh, will uh, redefine uh, TEA designation, limit the way we can use census tracts to determine what qualifies as TEA, and take the uh, decision-making authority out of the hands of the state government and give it exclusively to DHS, USAS, to determine uh, TEA. But these, um, and this rule here, as I said, is, is in its final stage. So right now, OMB is reviewing uh, uh, the regulations. Um, there are discussions, uh, having meetings with OMB to determine whether what the final rule will look like. Uh, but these, we're one step closer uh, from the investment amount to almost triple. Uh, to over 1.3 million in TEA. But the um, focus has been misplaced. Uh, none of these uh, provisions or in the regulations uh, seek to address redeployment or address retrogression to end these long backlogs. Um, the, and, but we can't blame Congress you know, for everything. Um, one of the chief uh, uh, obstacles to meaningful change in, in EB-5 arena has been the lack of consensus, 
right, in, in the industry, right? So, but one of the uh, most recent um, proposals was a couple months ago in HR uh, 1044. Um, this was pre a bill presented in the House of uh, Representatives, and it seeks to remove country caps altogether across the board for EB-5 or, or employment-based categories. And this gained a lot of bipartisan support, a lot of discussion. Uh, the momentum seems to have subsided for now. And, you know, admittedly, this has been proposed at least four times in the past several years. And on its face, it does seem that um, allowing a approaching this on a first come first serve basis regardless of country uh, would be a more fair approach but on a closer scrutiny you know this would actually disproportionately benefit larger or more populous countries um, in the eb5 context uh, this would mean that china uh, eb5 investors from china would would consume or occupy most of the visas for several years to come and it's been said too that even if under this paradigm, if a new EB-5 investor were to file now, they would immediately be hit with a 10 year wait. So this, this doesn't seem to be the approach to take. As I mentioned earlier, uh, for the first time, the EB-5 industry, stakeholders, um, regional centers, developers, urban and rural, um, seem to have achieved a consensus and so they've proposed alternatives to Congress. Uh, this would include a more moderate and incremental approach to increasing the investment amount uh, from 500,000 to 800,000 in a TEA and actually reducing the non-TEA from 1 million to 900,000. But in, to reward that TEA, they, they would redefine it, make it a simpler definition and actually seek a set aside of 3,000 visas, 30% of the annual visa quota for TEA projects. Um, that uh, would all be split between rural and urban. And then it would give those new TEA applicants expedited processing or priority processing. Now, of course, anytime we, we push someone ahead of the line, we correspondingly push someone to the back of the line. So we do need to consider the ramifications of these proposals. Finally, one proposal would seek to redefine the annual visa quota rather than determining it as uh, removing the family members from that count. So in other words, this means um, 10,000 investors instead of 10,000 visas uh, per year. You know, admittedly, the circumstances in which you are, you, need, you are choosing an EB-5 investment are not ideal. You know, that we are surrounded by an air of uncertainty. We don't know if and when or how EB-5 policy will be changed. Uh, we've seen um, President Trump's uh, expression for a complete immigration overhaul towards a merit-based um, point system. Uh, recently, uh, uh, the USCIS director was dismissed, and there's been a lack of consistency in, in, in leadership there. We don't know what the implications of that will be. We've seen litigation uh, against USCIS, um, and there's about the um, family members' derivatives being counted towards the uh, visa quota, or whether unsecured debt, uh, uh, unsecured loans uh, could be used as a, a source of funds. Um, We've seen increased pressure on H-1B visa holders with increased numbers of, of uh, RFEs, denials, and we're apprehensive about the potential end of work authorization for H-4 spouses. So these are the, the situations that, we're, that we find ourselves in when choosing or considering EB-5. But what we do know is that waiting won't help. It makes sense to file early, to lock in an investment amount, and to secure a priority date before the backlogs grow worse. Right? We cannot wait for uh, Congress to act. So we need to look to the market for solutions. Um, if we look in this room here, you can see that the 
if everyone here were to sign up for EB-5, about 25% or 30% of, the, of a, one country's annual visa quota would be consumed. Right? So it doesn't take much for that to happen, right, to hit that mark. Um, but, and, and there is obviously a frustration because of these uh, waiting lines, but as, as Fung and Colin pointed out earlier, you know, it's still early, right? Politics is uncertain. What is certain is um, the, the, the market, right? And we can look at the market to see what investments fit this reality. So we need to prepare for the long term. There we go. The policy change is not in your hands, but choosing your investment is. And so what we need to do now is to look at the state of the market. What kind of investments are out there now? Right? And Aaron will explore this and, and determine you know, whether these investments, investment types are adequately equipped to handle the pressures that we face now, retrogression, redeployment, long-term investments, and more importantly, whether these investments are designed to serve you under these new realities.